underestimate what people call like the soft skills, like time management, communication, uh, skills, and so on. I think that's incredibly valuable. Uh, in many cases, I don't say more, but at least equally than the technical skills. So like, don't underestimate those, work on those because they're very important. Having so many people reinventing the wheel and solving the same problem was, was not efficient. So the, the goal of Python was like, well, let's put some, even that we are all starting from these models. And then of course, someone in this group will want to add these extra physics and someone else will want to do something else. But like kind of the starting point, it's the same. Let's provide a tool that it's very flexible, it's very easy to build upon, that provides these models people want to solve. And then that will also provide a platform to collaborate because now if you're using the same tool, it's very easy to say, well, I had this new mechanism. At the end of the day, PhD, it's a learning experience, right? Like it's learning how to do research. And I would say like, if, if I got a PhD student that on the very, when, when they step in into the program, they, they basically can write the research plan and work independently and do that. Well, then why are you doing a PhD, right? Like that's what you're meant to learn over the, you, you charge it, it will last all day, probably even more than that. You charge every other day with the exact same phone after a few years, you charge it. And before you get home in the evening, you need to charge again, you need a power bank. Um, and that's, that's degradation, basically. That's aging. Machine learning is not the solution, as in it will certainly help, but you still need to understand the physics because often you don't have enough data to do a fully robust machine learning. So physics can be very, very, physics-based models can be very, very useful. So the products that, that we provide at Ironworks is uh, they build on top of, of PyBAM, of the open source PyBAM. And just to be very clear, the open source PyBAM will not go anywhere, will continue uh, to exist. And Ironworks is committed to, to support that. And in fact, we, we wrote a blog post very early on. These are an integral part of modern technology, powering everything from our smartphones to electric vehicles. And as we move into a future dependent, or I would say increasingly dependent renewable energy and electric power, you can think that batteries are set to rule the world in the coming decades, okay? Even recently Elon Musk has also mentioned that lithium refineries are like money printing machines. Now I think many of you are already aware that uh, battery industries dominate a significant portion of the market being essential components in mobile phones, laptops, electric vehicles and even grid storage systems. However, with this comes a lot of challenges that scientists and engineers are still striving to overcome. I will mention a few important points here like battery health and degradation over time. So what happened? Batteries wear out and don't work as well like it's earlier. For example, your mobile battery. You may have observed that in the first few months it works so well. You may not have to charge it so frequently, but it is still working very fine. But as time passes, you have to charge it very frequently. So this is some sort of battery degradation over time that makes them less efficient and shortens their lifespan. Efficiency and performance. We need batteries to be as efficient as possible, storing more and more energy and lasting longer. Well, to address these problems and in order to solve these problems, researchers use two main approaches. One is well-known technique, machine learning approach, and another is physics-based mathematical modeling. Well, we all know that uh, machine learning, what happened here, researchers use a lot of data to make decisions about batteries. Definitely because ML is a data-driven approach. It cannot work without data. So what researchers do, they experiment on those data, they analyze those, those data to get an outcome like when to recycle or to replace them. And this method looks for patterns in the data to predict battery behavior. However, as I mentioned earlier, ML requires a lot of data, a lot of resources, investment, which is a principal drawback. And this is a limitation for many researchers. On the other hand, there is another approach, as I mentioned, that is physics-based mathematical modeling. So what happened here in this approach, researchers use mathematics to simulate how batteries work under different conditions. And by understanding the physical and chemical process inside the battery, researchers try to discover the process, the method, how to improve the performance and extend battery life. Now, as I mentioned that mathematical modeling helps researchers to understand and to predict that what is happening inside the battery. By simulating, they can explore that what happens inside a battery as time passes. Now, this helps researchers to figure out how to slow down the aging process and make batteries last longer. On the other hand, when we discuss about efficiency and performance optimization, the efficiency of a battery depends on many factors, okay? So, only simulations is not going to help because lots of factors are involved here. Say, for example, if the 
temperature is quite high or temperature is quite low, this can impact severely in battery performance. For example, excessive heat can cause faster degradation, while cold temperature can reduce the battery's ability to hold a charge for a longer period of time. So it affects directly on the chemical properties of the battery. Apart from that, the type of material used in the battery also affect a lot. Lithium ion or nickel metal hydrate, all these materials, I mean, what are the material are used in, in the construction significantly impact its efficiency, energy density and cycle life. Now, with the help of mathematical models, researchers can simulate the chemical reactions inside the battery that help researchers to test different materials and design to make batteries store more energy and loss less. So, today we have a guest whose research is focused on this area. By profession, he is a mathematician and he will explain how mathematical models can improve our understanding and use of batteries. If you are a math lover and particularly if you love differential equations, then I would say that these sessions will be really interesting for you. It's an excited opportunity for you because you will learn about lots of real world applications in this direction of mathematics and mathematical research if you are planning to do research in mathematics. Then this session is particularly for you. Differential equations has lots of applications and in these sessions you will learn that how to get involved in this direction from this session. Okay, so without any further delay, let us begin our today's Thanks, Dr. Faran, for joining us in today's uh, podcast session. So we are going to have a lots of interesting topic discussions today regarding your research, your startup, and if you have any vacancies in your group. So starting with, if you share about your career journey, you have completed your undergraduate from Barcelona, and then you came here in Oxford University to pursue your PhD, and then now you are an assistant professor here at Warwick. Yeah, first of all, thanks thanks so much for, for having me over. It, it's a great pleasure to be here here and, and you know, to have this, this chat with you. So um, yeah, I, I'm originally, I, I grew up in a, a small town near Barcelona. Um, and basically, I think I always say like the way I ended where I am now, there is, there is a lot of chance in a way. Uh, when I was in high school, I really wanted to be an engineer. You know, It just turned out that I did pretty well at school and I was pretty good at math. So when I was applying for university, I saw there was this opportunity to study uh, a double degree in uh, and in this case, I chose maths and industrial engineering. That was at Universitat Politecnica de Catalunya. So yeah, I started doing my undergrad in engineering and maths. And what I found out halfway through my, my undergrad is that I really like maths very much. But more interestingly, I liked the math courses or the math models that help understand like the world around us would, would, would be basically applied math. And also I liked the models in engineering that were like kind of very mathematical. Well, I finished my my undergrad, and it was my final year, and I was keen on, on continuing my education and, and doing a PhD. And I got this uh, email as part of a newsletter. There were some openings at Oxford. So I, I applied there. That was literally the first place I applied for this program. I got an interview, and it was a disaster. Like, I really did a terrible interview. And, and you know, I came out with, like, okay, I'm not going to get offered a position. But it turns out that when I submitted the form at the end, they said, well, it was like 15 pages of form. It was very long. It's like, now that you got here, if you want, you can use this form to apply to two programs. So I thought, well, I've already filled the form. I'll apply to this other program on industrially focused mathematical modeling. But it turns out that two months later, I got an email being like, by the way, we'd like to interview you for this other program you applied for. And I was like, yeah, sure. I went to this interview and that one went much better. So I was offered a position. Uh, but at that time, I, I hadn't actually figured out what that program was doing. And I was very lucky because in a way, what that was doing was this thing I said, I discovered I like, you know, the, using maths to understand a world around us a bit a crossover between math and engineering, which is what, I guess, what applied mathematics is changes a lot. Mathematical model. Yeah, but it's the broader area of like applied mathematics, which is very different from country to country. And here in the UK, there's a very strong community about this mathematical modeling, industrial modeling, and so on. So I did my PhD there. When I finished, I felt like I wanted a change. Uh, and I felt like it would help to go to a place where I would work with people from other disciplines. So in a way, it's like, you know, there's all these things I don't know about. And I work with this very clever people that know about these things but the modeling part i'll be the expert i just have one query here that many times it happens that students have to write a research proposal before joining as a phd which is sometimes easier because if student has some earlier experience in their masters if they're taking any thesis but in either case most of the students i mean in most of the institutions there are still it is not possible students may or may not get a good guide to uh, to know the thesis work so how could they write the research proposals and what do you suggest regarding this that's a very good point. And, and unfortunately, I don't think I have a good answer because I think if I look at myself, where I was when I was applying for, for, um, for PhDs, I had no clue. And like, it's like, oh, I like this area, but I was not even close to the position to write like a research proposal. But, but unfortunately, ma many places work like that, right? You know, you have to a research proposal for a PhD. So I would say 
you know, bank on what you've learned through your undergrad degrees. If you can get some research opportunities because where you're studying offers that, pursue them. But if not, you know, I think just be, just be honest with me, like, you know, I have interest on this and this, and I think this is a very cool problem, but uh, I'm not an expert. I hope I can learn more because at the end of the day, a PhD, it's a learning experience, right? Like it's learning how to do research. And I would say like, if, if I got a PhD student that on the very, when, when they step in into the program, they, they basically can write the research plan and work independently and do that. Well, then why are you doing a PhD, right? Like that's what you're meant to learn over the, the three, four years that, that a PhD lasts. Alternatively, I guess I would advise people if they don't feel comfortable with that, explore other countries or, or other institutions, because I think the way PhDs work is very different from country to country. For example, here in the UK now, there is a lot of uh, CDTs or Center for Doctoral Training, which means that instead of applying yourself for a PhD with, with the specific professor, what you do is you apply for this program. The program has like some theme. For example, the one I studied on was in industrially focused mathematical modeling. You have a first year of training and at least six months before you have to make a choice of which project you want to do. And for me, that was super helpful because I could spend six years getting, sorry, six months taking some some, some training uh, on my first year. And then around March on my first year, when I had to spend six months there, it's like, okay, which project do I think I like? And, and a lot of that decision was driven by what I had been taught in this past six months. Let us now discuss about your research. So you are biased towards more industrial and applied mathematics and mathematical modeling oriented problems. So if you could share something about your current research. The, the way I like to describe my, my research interests is um, that my goal is to develop better models. To make an analogy, it's like a map. You know, if you want to go somewhere, you'll, you'll use a map to find your way. And of course, the map is not the real thing. In fact, a map is useful because it's, it doesn't show all the things, right? And, and you'll use different maps for different purposes. If I want to drive now to uh, back to my hometown, I'll need like a very big map with all the roads in, in the UK and in France and Spain. But if I'm going to London to visit someone, I need a map that it's much narrower and it shows me the streets and so on. So with models, it's the same. Specific. Yeah, exactly. So with models, it's the exact same thing. You'll need different models for different applications. And in some cases, you maybe you want to model that gives you a lot of accuracy on a very specific thing. But in some cases, you want a more generic model, maybe a bit simpler. You don't get the details, but you can understand things more globally. And, and that's that's what we do. We, we build these, these models, we, we develop them, we simplify them, uh, we, we implement them. Basically, we get into a computer and we develop tools to, to simulate them and, and get some predictions. And of course, as you said, I've been doing a lot of work on, on batteries. Specifically in batteries, what we try to understand using these models is how do batteries age? So we all know that if you buy a new phone, you, you charge it, it will last all day, probably even more than that. You charge every other day, but the exact same phone after a few years, you charge it. And before you get home in the evening, you need to charge again, you need a power bank. Um, and that's, that's degradation, basically. That's aging. So we want to have models that can explain that because if we understand what causes this aging, we can make better batteries, we can handle our batteries in a better way. For example, something that really explains how battery age is how you charge them. And then the other area that it's related, but on the manufacturing, a lot of these processes that make your battery have less capacity as time goes by also occur at the very early stages when the battery is being assembled in the factory. Uh, so if we can understand that better, we can speed up the manufacturing process. We can, we can make sure that we, we don't spend too much time doing some steps. That would reduce the cost, not only because of, of, of the time it takes, but also because this time often is that, you know, you have to keep your battery at a given temperature. I mean, you are trying to focus on the storage, how long energy can be stored in the battery. So how the things are going? I mean, uh, is, is there any mathematical equations you are following or you are developing some kind of... There's a lot of, of models you can use to explain batteries. Uh, of course, there's a lot of like data-driven models or machine learning. What we do is different it's this physics based models it's basically based as the name suggests in the laws of physics so you impose conservation of mass conservation of of charge conservation of energy these these fundamental physical laws and then we get these models that can explain what's going on inside of a battery it can basically explain how lithium ions move from one side to the other of the battery how that gives you some current that then you can use so what i'm saying here about the capacity is not saying you're, you charge your battery and lasts longer in one charge. It's this idea that a fully charged battery can hold less and less energy as your battery gets older, right? So this change on, on how what's the total amount of energy you can store, myself I'm doing, but also a lot of collaborators uh, around the world, is, is this idea of 
okay, what are all these effects that explain that, that we need to add to the model because they are not there. And the problem and the challenge at the same time is that there's a lot that can go wrong inside of the battery. You could have chemical reactions that would explain why this happens, but also you could have like mechanical effects. Your battery swells and shrinks and, and that causes some issues. Uh, and even worse, all these effects can be what we say coupled together. So this chemical reaction induces some mechanical stresses, which in turn uh, produce some cracking that gives place to some additional reaction. So everything is, is very tangled together. So there is a lot of work still to do to just try to understand which model can help us understand what's going on inside of, of the battery. So the motivation is to understanding the physical properties changes in the battery. It is not that you are thinking that how, I mean, how the properties can be modified in such a way so that its uh, storage limit increase. Yeah, so that's, that's a very good point. And, and naturally, that's the next step. Once we have the models that explain what we see, we can start interrogating the models and being like, okay, we know that this battery capacity is decreasing because of this effect and this effect. Now, what can we do to this battery? What can we change to suppress this effect? And it's not just how you design your battery. Going back to what I said earlier, how do you charge your battery? You know, maybe if, if we charge it in a different way, we'll suppress this effect or we'll minimize this effect so your battery will last for longer. So, in a way, building the models is just the first step to then ask, using the models as a tool and asking all sorts of, of questions to it. So, lots of other factors also involved here yes. whenever you are creating this model because based on country, based on weather, laptop, battery, these things also matters actually. Are you considering all this or you are focusing particularly in some cases? Uh, and that's kind of another moving part in your model is like, right, once you figure out or, or you think you figure out these chemical reactions or these mechanical effects, what you need to do is bring in, okay, what, how these things affect on temperature, because temperature is going to change everything inside of your battery. So often what you have is that these models, you can keep adding layers of complexity. You can just think of the electrochemistry, you can add the temperature, you can add the mechanics and so on. And, and I guess here is where um, I think that the modeler's job is, is where it's really important because we'll have a lot of people further down the line wanting to use this model. And with modeling, more is not always better. In fact, often more is worse because it means it's more expensive to solve the models. Like you need bigger computers, you need to spend more time. So I think that the most important job for the modeler is to be able to provide the right model for the right application. As in, you know, if you want to understand this effect on this effect, you don't need to go full on a model that you need to run in a supercomputer for three days, you can do something much simpler and that will do the job. However, if you want to do something else, maybe a bit more detailed, then you need this extra power. So as we are discussing about batteries and we are, you're also talking about the programming. So if you can share something about your developing Pi Bomb, yes, what is this open correct. source yeah. library and what is the motivation of this? If yeah, so Pi Bomb is a library, a Python based library uh, for modeling lithium-ion batteries. In fact, the name is PyBAM is an abbreviation for Python Battery Mathematical Modeling. And the, the spirit of PyBAM and the motivation why, why it was created about five, six years ago was that we found that across the various institutions doing research on batteries and doing modeling, each group had their own code in-house, like, you know, they had brought some MATLAB code, some Python code to solve these equations. And everyone was solving the same equations but everyone had their own code. And that was extremely inefficient because it meant often that was built by PhD students or postdocs, which meant that then they finished their jobs or their thesis, they went away and that code, well, they, no one else was supposed to use it. Uh, but also, even if you think of it, like having so many people reinventing the wheel and solving the same problem was, was not efficient. So the, the goal of Python was like, well, let's put some, given that we are all starting from these models. And then of course, Someone in this group will want to add these extra physics and someone else will want to do something else. But like kind of the starting point, it's the same. Let's provide a tool that it's very flexible. It's very easy to build upon that provides these models people want to solve. And then that will also provide a platform to collaborate because now if you're using the same tool, it's very easy to say, well, I add this new mechanism. And then someone is like, oh, I have this other mechanism. What happens if we put them together? So PyBAM as a project, as, as a tool, allows you allows you for that and since then the, the vision that was the original vision right let's provide this open source tool for people to, to collaborate and to not have to reinvent the wheel it has grown massively 
Uh, and now we have a lot of users all, all over the world. We have a very vibrant community. And we're about to planning on having the very first PyBAM conference, which I think uh, it's going to be a great opportunity to bring this community that many of us, we only know each other online because we interact through GitHub, we interact through Slack, we've never met in person, bring these people together uh, and hopefully make it a, a recurring event that can help shape the future of, of PyBAM and also uh, of the battery modeling community. So anybody familiar with Python code or those who are learning Python, they can work with PyBAM and implement them in their work? Yes, absolutely. So PyBAM is shipped as, as a, a Python package in, in PyPI, the, the Python project index. So if people do pip install PyBAM in their, in their machines, that will install the, the, the most recent version. And then they can basically start coding. Uh, and we've put quite a lot of effort. I mean, of course, it's a lot more things we can do, but to try to make it as easy as possible. So the idea is a lot of the things you need to solve the model have a default setting. People are welcome to change it, but if, if not, Python will assume what's most common typically, which means that you can, with just five lines of code, you can simulate this the Fuller Newman model I was talking about and get like an interactive plot that, that you can move a slider. It will tell you how the concentration in your battery changes, how the potentials evolve and so on. But that's just a starting point because then if you want something extremely tailored because it's open source and it's in Python, it means you can just go in there, tinker with the code and custom PyBAM to basically anything. And we have, if you go to our website, pybam.org, you'll find there uh, resources to some to the documentation. We have some PyBAM introduction. They guide you through the main features. So yeah, I would say if anyone who's listening to us is um, they're proficient in Python or they know how to use how to use Python and they, they just want to try Python, I would say give it a go. Uh, check the website, check the documentation, and, and just play with it. What are the problems can Python solve? So the scope of PyBAM are these physics-based models I was talking about, and these models are concerned about the battery of what we say at a continuum level. We don't care about what's called atomistic scale. We don't do those simulations. There are some other packages that are great for that. It is like if you have a battery and you want to understand how the ions and the currents and, and the potentials work inside uh, your battery. So PyBAM is very modular. You can start with these electrochemical models, like I said, this Durfler Newman model or single particle model. And then there's many options that you can activate the switch on or off to add new physics. So if you say, oh, I want to understand how my battery heats up, you can tell, well, I use this model and add some thermal model on top. And now this will tell you how your battery heats up and cools down as, as you operate it. If you want to understand how your battery expands and how the particles in your battery expand, you activate a mechanics model and you can do that. And the nice thing about PyBAM is that all these models are a bit like, we like to describe it as like Lego blocks. You can choose and combine them in, in, in many different ways to kind of tailor it to your application. And then, of course, from there, there's, there's all sorts of questions you could ask, like, you know, if I have this specific battery and I assume there is this degradation mechanisms going on, how long will this battery last before? I don't know. You have a startup on Ionworks, which is also related with some battery, developing battery modeling software. Yeah, so the mission of, of Ionworks is to accelerate battery research and development by leveraging the power of, of physics-based models. Because, well, if all the uh, R&D is based on experiments, that, that's really expensive because experiments take time and, and cost money. Um, so basically, the goal is to try to minimize how many experiments you need. You still need some, but you want to be a lot more targeting the specific experiments you need. And by, by using uh, models, you can cover, you can test so many more hypotheses and then just focus experiments to validate the ones that, that look promising. Uh, and it's one of those cases where um, we, we strongly believe from my words that machine learning is not the solution, as in it will certainly help, but you still need to understand the physics because often you don't have enough data to do a fully robust machine learning. So physics can be very, very, physics-based models can be very, very useful. So the products that, that we provide at Ironworks is uh, they build on top of, of PyBAM, of the open source PyBAM. And just to be very clear, the open source PyBAM will not go anywhere, will continue uh, to exist. And Ironworks is committed to, to support that. And in fact, we, we wrote a blog post very early on explaining what's the relationship between Ironworks um, and PyBAM. Allows you to, uh, you know, by a more graphical approach, you can run a lot of PyBAM simulations. You can leverage the, the flexibility and scalability of, of cloud solutions to, to, to test a bunch of hypotheses and then compare uh, the outcomes and, and many other things that, that you can do and that we, we are continuously adding to, to this platform and so on. So I would say 
uh, if people are, are keen to try, uh, they can have a, a free demo. So if they're looking into you go to Ironworks website and they click the link to Ironworks Studio, they can give it a go and, and feel like how, how Ironworks Studio feels like. So it is some sort of experimental lab of Pybomb. They have some products and, and users, those who are familiar with Pybomb, they can do their experiment in Ironworks. Exactly. So it's, it's a way of, of running Pybomb, if you wish. It's like, a, as I said, it's a virtual lab that runs on Pybomb. And, and as I said, like you can think of it, there is a, a free tier that is the open source. You can do, you know, all, all the, the models and so on go to the open source. We are actively contributing back to the open source. It just, it provides a, a neater way to streamline that can really, can really speed up how things work, right? Because you can run a bunch of different simulations very quickly. You can then just plot them all together. You have a much more visual tool of, of manipulating these, these outcomes. Um, and, and yeah, and the overall goal is to accelerate battery research and development. Okay, thanks, uh, Dr. Farhan, for having such a nice explanation of PyBOM and its experimental lab on Ironworks and about your research on top of that. So, can you share something about your current projects and vacancies for interns, PhD, or postdocs? The project um, I want to highlight that we're working uh, now is multi-scale modeling project funded by the Faraday institutions. So the work we're doing as part of this project is understand battery formation. So formation is the very first charge and discharge that you do to a battery, and that's done in the factory because it's so important that that's done correctly. They do it in the factory, and the reason is if you do do it if you don't do it correctly, your battery will last much much less time. It will die very very quickly. So what you want is to have these in a very controlled environment. The problem is that we don't understand very well how this works. We know that if you do it in a very specific way, it'll be fine. But we don't know why, and we don't know if maybe we're spending too much time in the process, and we could speed things up. The problem with the models is that most of the modeling efforts have been uh, targeted at understanding how the battery will uh, age and, and what will happen over days and months and years, but very little attention has been paid on what happens at this very early stage. And even that, the, the, the chemical mechanisms are very similar. How we model them needs to be very different because we're trying to target a much, a much different uh, scenario. So basically, we're developing this new generation of models that should help us explain what's happening at these very early stages of, of, the battery, of the battery life. Once you have some knowledge about what is going at the early stage, then what is the next step? So once you have that knowledge, the next step is actually improving the process or at least asking the question, are we doing it the best way we could do it? Because the way we're doing currently, it's been discovered by trial and error. These companies that make batteries, they've made a lot of batteries. They've been trying, like, okay, what happens if I do this? What happens if I have to do that? And they managed to, they managed to find a way that works. But we don't know if that's the best way. We know that that works. Whereas having a model allows you to test so many other scenarios. And if we understand what's, what's important according to, to our model, we can be like, well, maybe this step that we are now doing very, very slowly, we can do it a bit, a bit faster because actually it doesn't matter. What matters is that this following step that maybe we didn't think it was important, we need to be very careful here. So in a way, building the model is just the first step because the model is a tool. Once you have the model, you can start using that tool. You can start asking questions to the model to actually improve, um, in this case, how, how we make batteries. One final question here. Maybe the question will, will be very strange, but I, I think I need to ask that once you find a suitable model, Let's say for a, which works well in laptop battery. Will it work well in mobile or in car battery? That's a really good question. So it depends as in different batteries, many different types of materials you can build your battery and they all work differently. And, and that's another problem that I haven't touched on today, but it's also very important. These models have parameters. Parameters are basically some numbers, some quantities, some, some physical properties that explain what are you trying to describe. To put an example, how thick your electrode is, is a parameter of the battery because it dictates how, how it will behave. And these are quantities that in theory are, are known. You know, the battery you're trying to predict is that thick or is twice as much the thickness. But, under, but finding all these parameters is, is, is very hard because of course, I put the example of a thickness. A thickness is fairly easy. You go to the lab, you use some calipers, you measure the thickness and you can get that to some reasonable tolerance. But there's many other properties that are very hard to measure. And that is what will dictate eventually how, how the model performance is because you know I want the model to describe the battery in my laptop, but of course 
Now it's going to be different than the battery in your laptop, and it's going to be the battery different from a battery in, in a car. In fact, an electric car has hundreds of batteries in there, and they're always going to be slightly different. So being able to compute these parameters and, and that at the end is what gives you the accuracy in, in your model is, is really, really important. But again, we go back to the original problem. In order to find these parameters in an efficient way, you need to have a model that can run very quickly. Because in a way, the way you find these parameters is you run your model many, many, many times with slightly different parameters. And there's optimization methods that help you do that in a clever way. And then you find which parameters give you the best agreement with the data you have from the lab. But of course, to achieve this point, our models need to be incredibly fast, because otherwise there's no way we're going to do it. So that's a, a complete open uh, research area on what's the best way to, uh, to identify these parameters. I, I get often emails about people asking for vacancies and, and for positions. And I have to say, at least in the United Kingdom, the way it works is we kind of just create jobs ad hoc in this way of like, you know, here's, here's a job if someone asks for one. Jobs have our advertisers. There's a process we need to follow. Uh, jobs are advertised typically in the university website. So for example, in my case, if you go to the Warwick Maths Institute uh, website, there is a page uh, for jobs. Any job that is working my group is going gonna, is gonna to be posted there. Uh, so I would say the best way is like to keep an eye out, out there. Uh, but also, it can really help because, of course, that's, that's if you want to work with me. But uh, especially in the field of batches, there's so many opportunities uh, in many countries around the world. But I'll focus in the UK because it's what I know the best. But for example, the Faraday Institution has in their website, they have an opportunities page where they collect job openings in academia, in industry. So if people are interested, I would say keep an eye. Unfortunately, I think for, for academia especially, jobs come and go as in it's not, it's not a, a periodic cycle. It is for PhD applications, but for postdocs and so on, it's not like oh, all jobs come out this day or this month. It's more like you know, things will, will appear uh, and it's just a matter of, of being, you know, keeping an eye out there for things that uh, that arise. If you have to share any important advices for students, particularly from undergraduate to those who are thinking to join as a PhD or those who have already joined as a PhD, if you have anything to share for them. Yeah, I think if if I thought if I think of the, the three things that I wish I could tell my my past me when when I was in, a, uh, in my undergrad would be number one, do not underestimate what people call like the soft skills, like time management, communication uh, skills and so on. I think that's incredibly valuable. Uh, in many cases, I don't say more, but at least equally than the technical skills. So like don't underestimate those, work on those because they're very important. The second one would be look for mentors, supervisors, like you know the people you work with, especially the more senior ones that will lift you up, like people who will support you, that will help you grow. Like don't just go with the ones that look, the shiniest that, that publish a lot of papers. Don't get me wrong, that's important, but I think it's even more important people who will be a good mentor and will help you grow. And the final one, and that's to me the most important and, and probably related to the previous two, is like mind and take care of your mental health, your physical health as well, but especially of your mental health, because you know at the end of the day, uh, that does the most important thing, right? Like, and, and if you're not in a good position in terms of, of your, your mental health, you won't be in a good position to to the research and to enjoy it. So that's the most important. And yeah, it's the kind of stuff I wish I had been told at the major level stage because it, it's, yeah, it's always good advice. Thank you once more, Farhan, for joining us today and sharing your insightful perspectives. I personally enjoyed this conversation immensely and I hope uh, you did too. So I believe for our viewers, this yes. mainly for students, they will find it quite engageful and insightful and they have also learned lots of things from you today's session so yes looking forward to more talks on different topics thank you very much future. yeah thank you yeah thanks for having me over take care